Yeah, we're on the uh, third chapter this evening. Um, you got to have faith. Uh, there's some verses I'd like to share with you. Uh, every day I go to my prayer journal and I'm, I'm writing certain things in that the Lord gives me. And uh, I got on this page of faith one day. This was back last year in September as well. So I got to reading it the other day and I thought, okay, I think I'm going to share some of this. So uh, a lot of times he'll give me he'll give me quotes in sequence and I will just go ahead and write them down and I'll go, go into the Bible and then check the quote and just keep following it through. So uh, the the sequence that he gives a lot of times has meaning. Maybe it'll have the same meaning for you that it had for me, or maybe a different meaning, but I'll share them with you. Uh, the first one is Romans 10, 17. It says, faith depends on hearing, and hearing on the Word of God. So, the Word of God is grace to the hearer, which is another quote. I go to Ephesians 2, 8. It says, by grace we have been saved through faith. And that's faith in His Word and faith in His name as well. Uh, and then Romans 5.1, it says, By faith uh, we have access unto the grace in which we stand. So even though by grace we have been saved through faith, through faith we also have access to more grace uh, to help us stand, to help us walk. Uh, and it says, Without faith it is impossible to please God. So actually faith is, a, is an act of love by the grace of God that, that we have that we can offer it's a free will act as well. So uh, we, can, we can refuse to use the gift of grace, uh, not to use the faith, or we can go ahead and, and walk each day and looking in faith and seeing in faith and watching those little encounters that God has with us and for us and gets, shares with us to give us strength. Uh, the Word of God is, is one thing that He shares with us. Uh, if we have the willingness to go to His Word and to seek it, He'll have an answer for us. He'll have strength there for us. Same thing too in prayer. He'll bring us to that uh, to that wisdom, to that understanding. And he, a lot of times, will use the word. He'll recall it to our mind, and uh, it's strength to us. Every word that he gives us is strength to the hearer. Uh, James two seventeen. So faith too, unless it has works, is dead in itself. James two twenty two. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Uh, a lot of times this is a, this is a questionable quote. quote uh, faith too, unless it has works. Sometimes we uh, we get the works in front of the faith instead of the faith in front of the works. But it's uh, if we have faith, we need to walk in faith. We need to be doers of the word. And doer, doers of the words means that of the word means that we have to walk in that faith, and this is this is where we this is where we can stand true. This is where we begin living the word. I guess uh, we talked. I think the first class asking what it means to be a Catholic. Uh, to be a Catholic means to, as I summed it up, was living the word of God. So, what strengthens faith? The word of God. Is grace to hear? So, what strength is faith? Use, moving in faith, doing the works of faith, being doers of the word. And what strengthens faith? What strengthens the body? Uh, is food. And Jesus says, My food is to do the will of the Father. And where do we find the will of the Father? But in prayer and in, and in Scripture. Um, Exodus 31, 13, it says, It is I, I the Lord, who makes you holy. Remember to keep the Sabbath as sacred. And in the Sabbath, we find ourselves praying and staying in the Word. And that is what the strength that God has called us all to, that we stay close, close to Him, and that is where we get our strength. No matter what, what the burden and what the what the tribulations are. Uh, if we stay in the Word and stay close to Him, there will always be that strength. Always be that strength, Lord. Uh, keep in mind Hebrews 4.2. 4, uh, the Word that they heard did not profit them because they had no faith in what they heard. Uh, 
We can hear the word and yet choose not to use our faith. So too, free will or free choice has a lot to do with faith. And it's our choice as to whether or not we, we want to go where we need to go to get the strength, where we, where we need to go to uh, if we want to know what His will is. So with that, I'm going to turn over to the Father and, uh, and we'll look at faith even closer. Y'all have a good evening. Thank you. Um, before I get into that, as that's being passed out, there was a, a question um, put in our question box, and let me read it, and then I'll try to give the best answer that I can. At what point should a person worry they are giving, doing, and helping too much, damaging marriage? To what degree should one's partner's feelings of charity conflict when charitable feelings are much different from one's spouse, for one's spouse? Could the devil work to separate a marriage um, by placing needy situations in front of a person who is willing to give all possible help to others? And spouse is anti-giving. It seems God places people in need in my path constantly and I will give all I can to help. This causes grief for my spouse who is not very socially conscious. Well, I would say, first of all, in a marriage, uh, a sacramental marriage, uh, people need to have open communication, they need to negotiate, uh, they need to understand where each person is coming from, and they need to be on the same financial uh, plan. Uh, so there has to be agreement on all of these things. Um, so if, if a person is constantly and compulsively giving let's say a street person comes up and you give them $50 and uh, then then all of a sudden your house is marked because the street person is a drug addict and he goes to his drug addict friends and say this person here will help you and the next thing you know you have a, a ton of people coming to help you uh, get your help because you have a, a uh, a sign on your back saying uh, soccer uh, because they know how to manipulate you. Uh, so I would always direct people to the appropriate avenues of help and that you should give your money uh, in a proportionate way to those services or to those agencies that help people uh, and that you would not do that yourself. So you should have a plan in conjunction with your husband uh, or your spouse to make sure um, that you're in agreement upon, upon the manner in which you're going to be helping people. And yes, Satan can become divisive in a marriage, not only in this area, but in, in a whole lot of other areas. And that's why communication is so very important, uh, counseling if need be, and to recognize that spouses are not always on the same page on everything, and sometimes you have to negotiate, sometimes you have to compromise. Uh, what's most important is your marriage. Uh, and, and keeping that together. So I hope that helps uh, in terms of that question. What I want to talk about tonight, as I mentioned, are the controversial teachings of the church in terms of marriage, divorce, birth control, um, the whole phenomenon that's only relatively new in our culture, that of uh, same-sex marriage, sex outside of marriage, homosexuality, transgendered individuals, and and then finally, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about this last one, uh, why the church cannot ordain women as priests, why the Catholic Church cannot ordain women as priests. <clears throat> and that also applies to the Eastern Orthodox churches, like the Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, uh, so on and so forth. It's interesting when we talk about marriage that there are only two laws that Jesus uh, did away with in terms of the Old Testament. The first had to do with divorce. The apostles come up to Jesus and say to him, you know that Moses allowed for a written divorce, uh, that a husband could divorce his spouse uh, for a number of reasons, and that was true. In Judaism, a man could divorce his wife for a whole host of reasons. If, he got on, if she got on his nerves, he could divorce her. Uh, if she got too fat, he could divorce her. Uh, there were a lot of things, uh, a lot of reasons why uh, Jewish uh, 
a husband could divorce his spouse. And normally that would force the wife into poverty and then she would have to use some uh, unfortunate means to support herself. So there was a great injustice that took place there. So what Jesus says to the apostles who ask him this question is, yes, it is true, this is Jesus speaking, uh, about what Moses did, but what I say to you, if a man uh, divorces his wife and marries another, he commits adultery. And the same for the wife who divorces his, her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And that so upsets the apostles that they ask, well, gosh, uh, it's better that we not get married. Uh, uh, because uh, can you imagine having to live with your spouse for the rest of your life? Uh, so, so, and Jesus, well, if you can live uh, without being married, then those who are able to do so should. Now, we have to keep in mind that in the time of Jesus, there was an expectation that the end of the world would be, or after the resurrection of Jesus, that the end of the world would be rather, relatively soon. So uh, it wasn't until uh, time passed and uh, the early church began to realize that the second coming was going to be delayed and that we had to live this life as our Lord had asked us to do so. So the Catholic Church's teaching on the permanence of marriage goes directly to Jesus Christ and the fact that he forbade divorce and remarriage. The second thing that Jesus does away with in the Old Testament is an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. He has the precept of turning the other cheek and going the extra mile, so on and so forth. So, <clears throat> over the course of centuries, but early on in the church as well, marriage was considered or is considered a sacrament, an outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace. And it's interesting, too, that after Jesus uh, teaches this, one of the very first miracles that he is at the wedding feast of Cana. Uh, and, uh, and it's almost as though he recognizes that a wedding and the reception is a metaphor for what heaven is. It's the eternal wedding banquet of heaven, uh, eternal life in heaven. And that's what Jesus has come to bring about. We also know that St. Paul teaches in his letters that the love that a husband has for his bride is the type of love that Jesus Christ has for his bride, which is the church. Now, what type of love is that? Well, first of all, Jesus loves us, meaning the church, so much that he lays down his life for us on the cross. He is so committed to us uh, that he will forgive us no matter what. All we need to do is to ask that forgiveness. And he will not divorce us and look for another people. Uh, he is permanently committed to us. So the sacrament of marriage is meant to be an image or a sign or a symbol of the husband and wife becoming one in Christ and being visually to each other and to the world the relationship of Christ to his bride, the church. Meaning that the spouses must be willing to lay down their lives for one another. They must be willing to sacrifice, to love, and to forgive. And there ought to be nothing that would come into the marriage that would cause them to uh, separate and divorce. Okay? That's in the ideal sense. And if that is the case, and people enter into marriage with full consent of the will, they know each other very well, nothing is hidden about the other person, uh, there's maturity, there's no major psychological issues or uh, mental illness of any sort, uh, or... Um, uh, dependency upon any chemical substance such as alcohol or drugs of any nature, then the people that enter those marriages uh, in the church before God in the church, that is a lifelong commitment that no one can put asunder or no one uh, can divide. So what God has joined, no one must divide. So the church's teaching that divorce is not permitted goes back, first of all, to Jesus Christ himself. Secondly, to St. Paul's understanding of marriage as a sign of the relationship of Christ to his bride, the church. And then thirdly, to uh, the permanence of that relationship of Christ and his bride, the church. Okay? That's all on the ideal uh, level. But we also recognize that we live in a world 
where there, we're born with original sin, although it's washed away in baptism, but we also, because we're not made perfect in baptism, have the ability to sin. And we are all disordered or imperfect in one way or another. So it is the case that sometimes problems enter into marriage that are so great that the couple, for whatever reason, cannot live together. So the question is, can a Catholic seek a legal divorce under those circumstances? Well, what I would normally do in counseling a, a couple that is uh, being severely tested in their marriage uh, is, first of all, that you need to do everything possible to save your marriage. Uh, you need to seek counseling. You need to address the issues. But I would say if there's serious uh, physical abuse, or uh, is cause, the, the situation in the home has gotten to the point that it's causing terrible stress and anxiety, uh, and there just simply is no cohabitating whatsoever, the church pastorally understands that sometimes people can separate, okay? And sometimes it's advisable to seek a civil divorce in order that uh, justice prevails. Uh, so that the court of law would make sure the property is divided properly, uh, compensation is made, so on and so forth. Children are taken care of. There are agreements about uh, how the children will be cared for, who they will live with, so on and so forth. So in those kinds of circumstances, the church does allow for a civil divorce. However, if your marriage is a sacrament, in the eyes of the church, even though you have obtained a civil divorce for that marriage, you are still married in the eyes of God. Okay? The sacramental bond cannot be divided or broken by anyone, not the church or the state. It's established by God. So let me stop there. Does anybody have any question on that particular aspect of how we as Catholics understand the sacrament of marriage. Okay, okay. Yes. Uh, that's a good question. For a marriage to be a sacrament, first of all, Catholics must be married in the church. Uh, there can't be any previous marriages, obviously. And they have to enter knowing the other person. So if the other person has concealed something, or it's unknown to them perhaps, there could be an emotional or psychological immaturity or whatever, uh, or let's say one or the other of their spouse has no intention to be faithful whatsoever, and maybe there are indications, uh, uh, indications of infidelity within the courtship period, even before the marriage. Um, if that's going on, even though they go through a Catholic ceremony, it is not valid as a sacrament to begin with. Now, the church always presumes that it is a sacrament, okay? and we'll get into annulments in a second. So every marriage that takes place in the church, if it's the first marriage between uh, both of them, it is presumed to be a sacrament. So we don't, we presume that everybody's up front and they're mature and psychologically healthy and they've divulged the fact that they have a prison record and all the rest of that kind of stuff. You know, there's no secrets uh, of a significant nature, okay? We presume that all that's taken care of the day of the wedding. So we presume the marriage is, uh, is a sacramental marriage. Uh, but let's say after a person has obtained a civil divorce because, let's say, there was infidelity and ongoing, or there was physical abuse, or uh, there was a hidden uh, situation of alcoholism or drug abuse that only manifested itself later, uh, or a serious mental disability of some kind. The Catholic or the Catholics could enter into what is called an annulment procedure in the Catholic Church. It has nothing, when I say annulment, it has nothing to do with civil law or obtaining a civil lawyer. But the annulment procedure in the Catholic Church is a legal process within the Catholic Church utilizing church law and church lawyers, uh, those who are trained in the canon law of the church, to look at uh, this person's marriage to determine whether or not the presumption that it is a sacrament and thus for a lifetime and therefore cannot be dissolved by anyone uh, except through death, uh, the, whether the presumption is correct that it's a sacrament. 
So the couple or the individual that's pursuing the annulment fills out a questionnaire and answers questions about their family background, what led up to the marriage, what were the issues in the marriage. And if the church can determine that there was severe psychological immaturity or some deception of some kind or some chemical dependency that was there to begin with, or the person did not understand the Catholic meaning of marriage, that it's for a lifetime, uh, and that the vows were meant to be taken seriously the day of their wedding, or if there was um, uh, some other sort of uh, uh, misunderstanding about the permanence of marriage, the church, through her church, the church's lawyers and judges, can declare that the marriage as a sacrament <clears throat> never existed. Okay? But there was a legal bond. Okay? So even if the church declares your marriage annulled, the whole time you were married, the church recognizes that you were legally married in the eyes of God, that your children are legal, they're not considered uh, uh, illegitimate once the church says your marriage is annulled. Uh, so, so, it, so we're just saying there was a legal bond, but not a sacramental bond. So the presumption that uh, the marriage is a lifelong union, because it's a sacrament, is overturned by the evidence, and the church declares the marriage annulled. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, Catholics, as I mentioned, uh, must be married in the Catholic Church by a priest or a deacon. However, those who are not Catholic, we recognize your marriage no matter how it takes place. Whether it was in a church, if it's your first marriage. Now, you have to, both have to be free, meaning that there was not a previous marriage or a previous spouse that's living. Uh, so that you have to be free to get married and uh, you're baptized, and uh, you um, commit to a relationship. Now, your marriage might, ha if you're not a Catholic, either of you are Catholic, it could, be ta it could take place in a church, by a civil judge, a civil court marriage, or even civil law, uh, what we'd call, what's the, what's the term if you don't get, common law. Um, so it's the bond together uh, that creates uh, the sacrament uh, of marriage, if you're not a Catholic. So being married in the Catholic Church only applies to Catholics. Uh, we don't say that for anybody else. Okay. Now we, do, we don't recognize, as uh, the Church does not recognize, second marriages without the benefit of a Catholic annulment. So there may be some of you in here who are in second marriages and your first spouse is still living or the first spouse of your spouse is still living. So we would need to meet with you. In fact, we'll be contacting you from the, uh, the uh, um, registration form that you gave us to see what we need to do if we need to have your current marriage blessed in the church. And that's just a very simple renewal of vows, but there's a process that we have to go through. So is there any uh, question on annulments? Okay. Yes. You go to school, <laughs> and, and almost the same amount of time that you would for uh, a law degree, a civil law degree. Uh, for example, my previous parochial vicar, associate vic uh, pastor was Father Dan Furman. He was with me for two years, and he'd already had a, a degree, uh, a master's degree uh, in theology. So the bishop sent him off to the Catholic University of America in Washington to get uh, um, a higher degree. I don't know if you would call it, it wouldn't be called a doctorate, but a, a degree in canon law, and it was a three-year program. Uh, so, so six uh, semesters. Uh, and then he came back, and now he works in Savannah, helps with annulments. But bishops also need canon lawyers for a whole lot of other issues concerning church law, the education of seminarians, how to deal with priests uh, that might need to be disciplined. We have to follow church law. We don't make it up as we go. For example, a lot of the criticism of Pope Benedict when he was cardinal was that he didn't act quickly enough in some of these more notorious cases that are being reported in the press concerning errant priests. But the fact of the matter is he was following church law and due process. And they don't understand that. They think the Pope can just wave a magic wand and, and not deal with the issues of justice or law within the church. So, so bishops need 
canon lawyers in the church to help them on a number of issues. But the biggest issue is dealing with uh, uh, marital annulments. Yeah. And then I guess a follow up question to that would be is a canon lawyer a priest or a non? Normally it is a priest, but it doesn't have to be. So you can have lay people who uh, act as canon lawyers. In fact, up until about four years ago, there was a woman uh, in our tribunal who was a canon lawyer uh, and, and did what any priest would do as a canon lawyer as well. So a lay person can become a canon lawyer and, and get a job in the church. Not well paying, but can get a job in, in the church doing that. <clears throat> So the, 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 the thing that I really do want to emphasize is that the Catholic Church is not so rigid as to not be aware that people sometimes get into situations uh, that need to be addressed and we don't want to push people out of the church. So this annulment procedure is really a process to keep you in the church, especially if there's a, a second marriage. Uh, now, if you don't go through the annulment procedure as a Catholic and you happen to fall in love with somebody else and you want to marry them, you cannot be married in the Catholic Church unless the annulment is granted. And there's no guarantee that your annulment will be granted. You can go through the legal process and the church will say, look, this is a sacramental marriage. We can't declare it annulled. Therefore, you would never be able to marry in the Catholic Church if, if that, took, uh, that verdict were uh, handed down. So, um, so if the Catholic Church takes marriage very seriously and we want to make sure that all things are in place uh, prior to somebody getting married, so we do a rather lengthy preparation for the sacrament of marriage, but also if somebody does divorce who is married in the Catholic Church, we want to work with them to make it possible for them to have another marriage, if it's possible, and the only way that we can do that is through a legal process that we call annulment, uh, a church legal process. Okay. Any other? Yes. There's no annulment process? No. no if, so in the church, a marriage is not forever. It's until death do you part. So once the death occurs, then you are free to marry. Uh, so let's say that you did divorce and then uh, uh, 40 years, and you married outside of the church because you couldn't get an annulment, and then 30 years later your first spouse dies, then you can have your current marriage uh, uh, blessed in the church. Okay. If the person never converted? No, no. Uh, the question is, what if a, a Catholic marries somebody that's not a Catholic? We would treat that as we would, if the person is baptized, the Protestant, let's say, we would treat that as a sacramental marriage. We would see no difference between it and, and them being married to a Catholic. However, if a Catholic marries somebody who's not baptized, that's not considered a sacrament because it has to be between two people. So you can see, even within uh, the church, you can have a marriage that's not considered sacramental because it, it has to be between two married people. The church prefers you to marry a Catholic. By way of exception, uh, we allow you to marry somebody that's not a Catholic. And by way of a more extreme exception, we can allow you to marry somebody who's not even baptized. But if you marry somebody that's not baptized, that marriage is not a sacrament, it's just a legal bond. So let's say that that marriage ends in divorce there's a different procedure you go through. It's not an annulment. It's, it's a way to prove that the person wasn't baptized and then the church issues a declaration of dissolving that union uh, because it wasn't considered a sacrament in the first place. But their marriage was considered moral okay, and legal while they were married. Uh, so I want to emphasize that with annulments because there's a lot of misinformation in the secular press about people complaining that when the church issues an annulment, then the church is saying, all my children are illeg illegitimate, I was living in sin this whole time, and that's not what we're saying at all, okay, uh, when we issue an annulment. That's not what the church is saying. Now, if a Catholic marries outside of the Catholic Church, let's say that uh, they're free to marry, they have no previous marriage, and their would-be spouse has no previous marriage, but they don't get married in the Catholic Church, the church does not recognize that marriage. So the Catholic technically should not be receiving Holy Communion when they come to Mass. And that's also true for those who uh, divorce and remarry without the benefit of an annulment. It cuts them off from receiving Holy Communion. Now the point of that is to encourage them to seek the proper channels, the annulment procedure, in order to make sure that when they come to Mass, 
they can receive Holy Communion. However, if a Catholic divorces legally but does not remarry, they can still receive Holy Communion. Okay? It's the remarriage outside of the church that uh, is considered uh, irregular. Because what does Jesus say about the person who divorces his spouse and marries another? They're committing adultery. And that's what the church is saying. You, if you're in a state of adultery and, and remain in that, then you should not present yourself for, for Holy Communion. Okay? So any question on marriage before I move to the next controversy? Well, we, the church, Catholic Church would discourage Catholics from destination weddings because marriage is a sacrament of the church. It's like saying, I want a destination uh, whole, First Holy Communion. You say, see what I'm saying? This is like receiving Holy Communion. This is like going to confession. This is like getting ordained a priest. When you get married, it's a church sacrament. So, so if you can arrange for a Catholic marriage at the destination you want to, that could be possible, but you would have to do a lot of things to prepare for that. So, so we, we don't really uh, encourage destination weddings because you really should have all of your sacraments in the church in which you belong. Uh, uh, so if your child is making his first communion in the second grade, you wouldn't send him to London uh, on a trip to have his first Holy Communion to make it special. It's special that he's receiving his first Holy Communion in his parish church. And the same thing would be true of the sacrament of marriage. Okay? By renewal of vows, what do you mean? The, um, Mm -hmm. Well, that's different. We, if you're married already uh, sacramentally and then you want, let's say, on your fifth anniversary or 25th anniversary, you want to renew your vows somewhere else, you could do that. Okay. There, there's no issue there with that. Yeah. Right. But it is, rec but your marriage is recognized. Okay. As soon, now this is interesting. That's a very good question. A ca your wife is Catholic. You're not baptized. You were married here to St. Joseph's. And technically, that marriage is not considered a sacrament. But as soon as you are baptized at the Easter Vigil, whenever, and have a relationship with your wife, it automatically becomes a sacrament at that point. So there's no need for uh, an additional ceremony. Because really, in the sacrament of marriage, it's your life together that really is a sacrament. What about what if you get a divorce between now and now? Now's the time to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> okay. Now, some people will have a renewal of vows, and that's up to you. I mean, but but it's not necessary. Okay. Okay. Any other question on that? Okay. <laughs> okay. The next thing I want to talk about is birth control because. That probably is, uh, in our current culture, one of the most uh, controversial things. And if the Catholic Church is being crucified by the secular world on anything, it's on our teaching on uh, birth control. The Church, from the very beginning, has only permitted, within the context of marriage, uh, natural family planning, which means abstaining from sex during the fertile time of the woman. Now, for centuries, there was no such thing as artificial birth control. It was a crude form of a condom, uh, but that was about it. The only options that, that married people had, are there, are there children in here before I start talking about anything that might embarrass anybody? Because, I, you know, we have to be uh, frank with each other. Uh, in terms of birth control, the only uh, condoms are not allowed, and uh, never have been, even when they were crudely made. Uh, and withdrawal, uh, it not completing the marital act, uh, is not allowed. In fact, that goes back to the Old Testament of Onan spilling his seed outside of the, uh, the vagina of, of his wife. Uh, so those two methods were always prohibited in the Catholic Church. It's only been in recent, and then certainly abortion, uh, has been used as a, a birth control for, for centuries, uh, but has never been permitted by the Catholic Church because we would see that as, as the killing of an in innocent child. So it has, it's only been probably since the 1950s with the advent of technology 
that has improved the condom but also given us the pill and now some other means of artificial contraception that uh, people began to expect that the church would change as technology developed, especially with the advent of the pill. So much so that in the 1960s, Pope Paul VI set up a, a, a committee of priests and lay people to advise him on the advisability of changing the church's teaching on artificial contraception, given the fact that the pill was being developed and some other things were on the horizon. After he listened to the advice given to him, he decided that he would continue to teach uh, the traditional teaching of the church that uh, artificial contraception went against natural law and therefore the church could not condone uh, the use of artificial con contraception. Because you can't go to the Bible and find anywhere that says that you shouldn't use artificial birth control because there was no such thing when the scriptures were being written. Uh, that was a subsequent development uh, in the 20th century. So we have to rely not on scripture but rather on tradition, what has been the constant teaching of the church in this area of how to plan your families. And then secondly, on natural law, meaning by natural law, you have to look at what is the nature of the human person, male and female, and of the sexual act within marriage of the male and the female. Why is it that there is sexual intercourse? And you know from the study of biology that it's primarily for uh, the propagation of, of people, for, for the ongoing population of the world. Uh, so everything is made as they are in order for a man to uh, contribute to a woman, uh, his sperm to fertilize her egg that then becomes a fetus and develops into a human being. And we believe that at the moment of conception, when the egg is fertilized, that everything that is necessary uh, for that to become a mature human being is there, including the soul what uh, God gives uh, at that point. So, we would say that artificial contraception changes the meaning of sexual intercourse within marriage and only uh, emphasizes one aspect of it, which is the unitive or the pleasure aspect of marriage to the negation of the procreative part of marriage. Okay, So you're tampering with what God created and molding it into an image of what you want it to be rather than what God intends it to be and that goes against uh, natural law. So the church has always said that the only means of planning a family and we do expect Catholics to plan their family is natural family planning. That has developed over the course of time as well since the 1950s and there's a very sophisticated means today to determine a woman's fertile period if she has a regular cycle. And during that fertile period, one can plan a family if they want to have children and use that time to their advantage. Or they could abstain from sexual intercourse during that, what, seven to 10 day period. Is that correct? Is that the window of opportunity in a woman's fertile cycle? I know it varies from woman to woman. But it's about a 10 day period, correct? So you have, uh, 10 days where you're asked to live without sexual intercourse. Now, the difficulty there is that I am told that when a woman is in her fertile cycle, she's all the more desirable by her husband, or the husband desires her all the more. So you have to take some precautions, obviously, yeah. uh, to make sure that in that 10-day period, uh, you don't have sexual intercourse that then will lead to a pregnancy, okay? Uh, so you can use that period of time. Now, People who successfully use natural family planning have some of the strongest marriages that I know of because the husband has to cooperate in this planning of the family and because they abstain for uh, you know, a couple of weeks or 10 days uh, within the month, uh, they appreciate their sexual relationship all the more uh, when they're able to, to have it uh, uh, as they normally would. So, that is permissible in the church, and if you do it according to how it's, you're supposed to do it in terms of determining the woman's fertile cycle and all the rest of that, 
it is 98% effective as a means of, of uh, uh, spacing your family or planning your family. Whereas ar most artificial birth control is only 98% effective as well, if, if not less. Uh, so does everybody understand the theological reason why the church does not permit artificial birth control, like the pill, condom, IUD, even tying of the tubes, including um, uh, vasectomy and any other sort of intentional surgery to prevent birth. Now you can, you know, if you have an, an illness uh, related with your uh, fallopian tubes or your uh, womb or whatever, a hysterectomy is certainly allowed uh, if, if that's necessary for medical reasons. But not, the church would not condone that for birth control reasons, okay? Does everybody understand that? <coughs> And we're also finding that the pill can lead to other health issues, uh, could increase the risk of cancer, heart issues, blood clots. blood clots. And so, you know, you're putting a chemical in your body. You're going against nature. It's never nice. It's never good to go against nature. Um, uh, now, the other thing that Pope Paul VI in 1968 was concerned about was if he allowed artificial con contraception and went against the tradition of the church as well as uh, natural law, which would then open the door on a number of other issues uh, not related to uh, sexuality, that he felt that men would lose respect for women, husbands would lose respect for their wives, and the power of procreation that they carry with them. and they would use their women or, or their, their wives as sexual objects just for their own sexual fulfillment uh, and not care less about uh, the other aspect of, of marital, uh, marital love. And he felt that that would have a detrimental effect upon marriage leading to an increase of divorce and then that would have a detrimental effect upon society and it could also raise health issues and uh, psychological issues, and guess what is happening in 2010? Because we have an artificial contraceptive uh, culture now. Uh, how high is the, the sexual uh, disease rate, uh, including AIDS now? How high is the divorce rate? Uh, do men and women actually respect each other when it comes to sexuality, uh, outside of marriage or in marriage? Uh, so you can see that the Pope was almost prophetic in his uh, concern that the church not change its teaching in that area. But we recognize that it is a, a challenge. Uh, the next area that I want to talk about is same-sex marriage. This is something new, obviously. I mean, gosh, how long do you think that, that the whole idea of same-sex marriage has been going on in the United States? 10 years? 15 years? 20 years at the most? Uh, so this is being pushed as an agenda uh, that is not coming naturally to Americans, but we're being kind of brainwashed and manipulated by a particular political, powerful political group in our country that has a, 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 a death grip, grip on the media and on TV shows and movies, and our we have changed as a culture in terms of being open to the possibility of same-sex marriage to the point that now they're trying to legally uh, change the defini definition of marriage in various states. Several countries in Europe and elsewhere have already done so, and it looks like the United States may be moving in that direction as well. Uh, only time will tell. The Catholic Church is opposed to same-sex marriage. Uh, just as most of traditional Judeo-Christian thought is opposed to same-sex marriage. Much of it hinges on natural law, procreation, the ability to have children and form a Christian family or a, a family union, uh, whether you're Christian or not, uh, and that that is what the definition of marriage is as designed by God, and that we can't change what God has designed. Now, I can't go up to an atheist or to secular culture and say, God does not want uh, uh, same-sex marriage. They're going to laugh at you. So the church has to approach it on a different level and say, if we change the definition of marriage, that is going to open the door to a variety of things. 
For example, why can't I marry my mother so that I can eventually get uh, her retirement when she dies and Social Security and all the rest of that? Anybody? But who cares? I mean, this is all about uh, rights. My right, okay? Or, Buck, you had an example. Uh, if you open the door to same-sex marriage, what would be some of the other, other things that could happen? Uh, well, just on policy grounds, uh, <coughs> I'm one of the few people, I mean, y'all have probably heard a U.S. federal district judge in uh, California uh, struck down the California gay marriage ban. Uh, I'm one of the only people I know who's actually read the opinion. I've not read it thoroughly. It's a long opinion, but I've actually forced them out for that. And if you apply the reasoning that that judge applied, then you must allow polygamy. Uh, you, you must allow uh, in, uh, legitimization of incest through marriage. Uh, it makes no, it, by his logic, it makes no distinction. Uh, I can make, take it even further for the law students out there. Uh, why couldn't I marry a Galapagos turtle but to have lifespans of 180 years in a way of getting around the, the property rule against perpetuities? Uh, it doesn't hide my property for 150 years after my death. Uh, once again, if you follow the reasoning of this judge of California, those things must be allowed. Uh, and societies have always regulated marriage. Now, always. Now, if you <coughs> don't care to be logical, then, yeah, it's easy to say, yes, uh, homosexual marriage is allowed with polygamy and polyandry or not. But then you're not being logical. There's no principle behind it at all, and it's just, you know, if it feels good, do it. So, and if it feels good for me to go out and commit a chainsaw rape, then I'll be able to do that. So, so it opens the door to a number of things. So from a legal point of view, the church has to use arguments like that. We can't say, well, this is how God planned it, and you can't change it. They're going to laugh at us. So we have to look at other uh, precedents in terms of that. Um, and you, you just don't know what, what doors are going to be open. Now, there is an argument from those who say, well, we're not Christian, or we don't buy into the Christian understanding of marriage. <laughs> and we want to have some rights uh, if we're living together. And I would say that the church is not opposed to that, like, uh, uh, what do you call them, civil unions, uh, where, you know, if, uh, if your partner is sick, you can visit them in the hospital. And I, the church doesn't want to get into, involved with uh, financial issues, but in terms of inheritance and maybe Social Security and all the rest of that, that's something that could be worked out legally, but the church would never recognize that as a marriage, nor should it be called a marriage, okay? We wouldn't condone that, but we wouldn't necessarily be vehemently opposed to that on a, a civil level, okay? Now, in terms of um, uh, sex in general in the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church is all for chastity, meaning outside of marriage, one abstains from sexual intercourse, and within marriage, one is faithful to one's spouse. Okay? Uh, that doesn't mean that you're not having sex with your spouse, but that you're faithful to that spouse. Uh, so that's the church's bottom line premise that applies to homosexuals and heterosexuals and those who would consider themselves bisexual or transgendered or whatever. Uh, that um, chastity is what we're called to recognizing that that is a challenge and that you need a community that supports that sort of a decision. So from scripture we believe that any time a person has sex outside of marriage that is a very serious sin and it's called fornication. And St. Paul says that fornicators will not enter into the kingdom of God. Those who are married and have marital relations or sexual relations with someone who is not their spouse, that's considered adultery. Again, that is a very serious moral offense before God. What does the church teach about homosexuality? First of all, we don't believe that when the church talks about homosexuality, we're not talking about homosexuals. We're talking about homosexual acts and making a judgment on that, okay? We don't know why some people are homosexual and why some people are heterosexual. I know we have a, a psychiatrist in our midst who probably has some opinions on this, but they're opinions. Uh, 
we believe in original sin and we're all disordered, whether we're heterosexual or, or homosexual. So, that, so even heterosexuals can have a disordered sexuality, uh, uh, just as homosexuals have a disordered sexuality. There's nothing wrong with being disordered. That's part of our human condition. The, the problem is when we raise a disorder to the level of being normal and natural. Okay? So we would say that homosexual acts go against natural law because there's not a complementarity. It can't lead to any form of procreation. God did not intend this. Okay? And that that uh, would be considered, those acts would be considered immoral. Were you born like that? Possibly. We don't know. Were you made like that because of your circumstances growing up? Possibly, we don't know. Can you learn this sort of behavior? Possibly, more than likely. So, so we don't make uh, a condemnation of the person, but we ask them to find the means, by God's grace, to live uh, a, a chaste state of life. Now there's some flexibility in that, uh, in terms of friendships and uh, that are chaste, uh, and God being patient with someone that he is redeeming, so on and so forth. So we don't come out and rail against homosexuals and protest against them and, and condemn them and uh, mock them or discriminate against them. Uh, although there is a tendency in our culture to do that, isn't there? Okay, so we have to be, be very much aware that, that there are some injustices that have been inflicted upon uh, homosexual individuals and and, and, but I think that oftentimes the media misrepresents what the church teaches in this whole area uh, for a, a, another agenda. So, so we should be aware of that. In terms of changing one's sex uh, through surgery, again, we would say that that goes against natural law. Unless there is some uh, biological reason, uh, gender confusion from a bi biological uh, as a biological basis where it's not clear whether the person is a male or a female, then a surgery to correct that is permissible. But just because somebody feels like that they're a woman, but uh, they're actually physically a male, the church would say you would not have a moral right to change your gender because your gender is assigned by God. Uh, and that would be going against natural law. So you can see if the church changed one area of natural law, there would be a trickle-down effect to all areas. And the Catholic Church is really, the, along with the Orthodox, are the only major churches that teach natural law. Most Protestant den denominations have done away with that a long time ago. And that's why they are able to allow for a lot of things that the Catholic Church would say goes against natural law. Okay. So is there any question on any of that? Yes. If I could just add one point along there, uh, and, and you may have mentioned this and I missed it, but uh, every major Christian sect, uh, including every Protestant church, until the 1930s consistently taught since its beginning that contraception uh, is sin. Uh, there was no exception until the 1930s when the Anglican Communion uh, went with the thin end of the wedge and said, well, there may be some certain circumstances. And from that point on, within 30 to 50 years, all of the, everybody except the Catholic and the Orthodox uh, had, had jumped on the pro-birth control. <coughs> uh, so I thought that, that That's was a good uh, so okay. it's, it's not the Catholic Church that's out of step, it's everybody else. Mm -hmm. Everybody else has reversed course in the right. last hundred years. Right. Mm -hmm. Any questions on that? Yes, Charles. Well, they're considering um, humanity and all that you have said about humanity. Under another call for Pope Benedict, could he write an encyclical and change what was then? Normally, no, uh, and I don't know that there's any precedent in history in terms of reversing uh, an official teaching of the church. So that probably won't happen. But, the, but you, with moral issues, you can't say that in every case this is true. Okay? For example, thou shalt not kill. That's one of the Ten Commandments. You don't need the church to declare that infallible. That's the word of God. 
But even there, there are some caveats, right? Just war, unjust aggressor, self-defense, you can kill. Uh, rats that are in your house, you can kill those. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so that, I would say, is more serious than birth control. Okay. So you can't say for any one individual that it's wrong for them, okay, blanket. Does that make sense? I mean, you might have eaten a very powerful Right, right. Right, no, it, it would not. It would be ever, ever overturn. It won't be. It won't be. Okay. Okay, the last thing and that I want to talk on briefly is why the church cannot ordain women as priests. From a sociological point of view, there is no reason why a woman could not be ordained a priest. In fact, I would say there are some women that would make better priests than most men. Okay, well, most, most women would make better priests than most men. Uh, in terms of empathy and caring for people, and being spiritual and praying, so on and so forth. So, it must be something other than a sociological reason why the church cannot ordain women priests. And the first goes to the very nature of what the priest represents from a sacramental point of view. Now keep in mind, a sacrament is instituted by Christ, uses signs and symbols to point to what he does in specific situations. The priest, when he celebrates Mass, acts in the person of the risen Lord, who is a man, who suffered and died on the cross for our salvation and offered himself to the Father. And in the celebration of the Mass, it becomes explicitly clear that Jesus Christ not only is sacrificed on our behalf, but he is also the bridegroom of the church. The church collectively in the, is the feminine or, or, or the, the bride of Christ, okay? So when you watch, when you go to Mass and a priest is celebrating Mass, especially when he consecrates the Eucharist, he is acting in the person of Christ. It's not the priest who is consecrated in the Eucharist. It is the Lord, Jesus himself, the risen Lord, who is doing it. The priest is just a sacramental image of that. Uh, and all that Jesus is for the church. He is the high priest Jesus is, and the priest is always in the Old Testament as a male. He is the sacrificed victim, and he is the bride of, uh, he is the groom of the bride. Okay? Can a woman be a groom? No. Can a woman be a man? No, okay, even if there's a biological surgery or a surgical procedure. Uh, no, okay. So, if you have a woman celebrating Mass, what does that say from the point of view of sign value? She's the bridegroom. She's a woman. How can she be a bridegroom? How can she image Christ who is a man? She can't, right. So you have a perverted situation in the celebration of the Eucharist, where you have a female who says she is an image of the groom, and you have the bride who is the bride, okay? Uh, and so it's, it's a perversion of the sacrament. Yes? You are a priest forever, according to the audience. Correct. Right, the Old Testament priesthood was always male. It was only the pagans that had female priests, okay? So, so because they didn't have the same understanding as the Old Testament did of, of the Old Testament priesthood that eventually prefigures Christ and his high priesthood and then the ordained priesthood of, of the Catholic Church, okay? So, Jesus only called 12 men to be his apostles. They are the first bishops of the church. And in the 2,000 year history of the church, we have never ordained women priests, ever. Neither in the Roman Catholic Church or in the Orthodox Church, the churches of the East, okay? 
Protestants have because they did away with the sacrament of marriage. Martin Luther said there are only two sacraments, baptism and Holy Communion. So they don't understand marriage as a sacrament. They don't believe that marriage is a sacrament. So within their traditions, there's no reason why a woman could not be ordained to their ministry because they don't believe in priests, ordained priests. Okay? Episcopalians are a little bit different. They have changed. Some of them don't believe in the sacrament of holy orders, but others do. But they have changed the meaning of the sacrament of holy orders to accommodate sociological trends. Uh, modern trends. So they've kind of perverted uh, the true meaning of the sacrament of holy orders in order to accommodate women being ordained priests. But they have a very, the Episcopal Church is very influenced by the Protestant Reformation. And most Protestants at the time of the Reformation did away with the seven sacraments except for baptism and Holy Communion. Okay? So, so they would have a, they're on a different playing level, a playing field, because their ministers are not priests and don't function as a Catholic priest does when they celebrate Mass, when a priest celebrates Mass. Okay? Does anybody have any question on, on that? Yes? With breastfeeding? Uh, that's up to you. Uh, obviously, breast milk is the most natural way, but we recognize sometimes that it can't take place for a whole host of reasons. So uh, whatever else is available is, is fine. There's no moral issue there. Okay, on that. The question is, uh, obviously because our, our mores are changing in terms of same-sex issues or homosexuality, now you have high school boys wanting to bring their boyfriend to the prom or to a, a school dance. I think what boards of education probably, will, they, they'll have to allow it or not have dances, you know, and let it become a private association. And then the private association can determine what's going to happen. Uh, so, I, so I think that, that we're going to have to deal with that. Um, that's why I think public education is in such bitter straits right now, because um, you can't teach any morality any longer traditional morality, anything goes. So, so we're, we're really up the creek <laughs> in that regard, yeah. yeah. Yes? Um, Did everybody hear that question? What is the, the church's teaching on abortion if it concerns uh, a child that's severely deformed or has a terrible genetic uh, issue or if it came about because of rape? Let me talk about that. The church would say that abortion as a result of a, a, a rape, a conception that's a, is, a, is the product of a rape, the victim uh, is the woman that is raped, but we can't re-victimize the baby who's the innocent victim there. So we would say and pray that the person would allow the, the, the pregnancy to come to term and then give the baby up for adoption, or I've known some situations where they kept the baby. Um, so, so we would say that you can't Two evils don't make a right. Uh, so obviously the rape was evil and wrong, but then killing the innocent child who becomes a product of that would be immoral as well. Now I realize that that's a very emotional issue and I can see how other people would view this differently. Uh, but that's, that's the church's teaching. Now in terms of an, a major illness, uh, you can never do, uh, the, let's say the mother has a major illness and she's pregnant. You can never have a direct abortion However, the mother could, in consultation with the doctor, the family, the priest, decide on a course of treatment that indirectly causes an abortion, okay, uh, to save her life, okay, so, so, but there's not a direct attempt to remove the baby, it, it's just the treatment that is given causes a, a spontaneous abortion or whatever. Technically, because that's an indirect result of treating something else, the cancer or whatever, this comes about, that one could make that moral decision and still be a, 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 a good Catholic. Or they could decide, no, I'm going to let the disease take its course and the baby be born and then the mother dies. She could make that decision too, morally, uh, if she wishes, in consultation with the family, the doctor, the priest, so on and so forth. So you can never directly abort a child to save the mother's life, okay? That's our, our teaching. 
So if you're in a Catholic hospital, technically that could not take place. Uh, now let's say that you have a child that has a severe genetic issue or deformity or whatever. Uh, I've dealt with many women who have had situations where there's no way the baby will live once the baby's born, but they carry them to term anyway. And I was in, in the delivery room and baptized a baby and was holding him and he died in my arms. Not more than five minutes after he was born. But she knew, the mother knew this was going to happen. But she was willing to bring the baby to term and has a very spiritual bond with this baby. I, don't, I mean, it's just, even though the baby's in heaven, uh, th there's a very strong bond that, that has taken place there. So I think when you have a respect for human life and, you know, leave it in the hands of God, and even with a, a child that has Down syndrome or some other deformity, God's grace will provide marvelous help to uh, parents or uh, to others if the parents are unable to cope with the situation in terms of adoption or, or uh, other situations in that regard. So we don't, we can't uh, ever say that you could kill a child uh, in the womb because there's something wrong with them. Um, and I've seen, especially with Down syndrome babies, just blessings upon blessings uh, on families that, that have these children. Does that answer your question, Mason? Yes. The question is, why in the Latin rite of the Catholic Church, the Roman rite, which we belong to, priests are not allowed to marry, or even married men are not allowed to become priests? And it, it, it goes really to, it's a church discipline, it's not a, a, an unchanging, it's not something that couldn't be changed, it could be changed. And in fact, in the early church, there were married clergy, okay? Uh, and there still are in the Catholic Church married clergy. The church is divided into the East and the West. Orthodox priests have always been allowed to be married before they're ordained. Okay? So in the Greek Orthodox Church, which is not affiliated with the Pope, but has seven sacraments like we do, if a man wants to become a priest, he has to, and he's married, he has to be married before he becomes a priest. So normally they would go through a certain amount of uh, seminary training, and then if they want to be married, they go out and get married, and then they are ordained. Or if they want to be celibate, they can be, and once they're ordained, they cannot get married. Okay, so they have to remain unmarried. Bishops in the Orthodox Church must be unmarried, uh, must be celibate. Our tradition has been, for the last 1,200 years, is exclusively uh, celibate except in certain situations. For example, we will uh, receive Episcopal priests, reordain them as married men, and they can function, <coughs> can function as Catholic priests. And the Pope has even allowed uh, en masse for that to occur with the Church of England, uh, because there are a lot of people that are dissatisfied in the Episcopal or the Church of England and are seeking full communion with the Catholic Church, and there may be whole congregations that will come over, and the Pope will allow their priests who are married to be ordained Catholic priests. But we also have in the Eastern Rite of the Catholic Church priests that are in union with Rome who are married. Uh, uh, but they have to be married before they are ordained priests. Uh, once they're ordained, they're not allowed to marry, uh, uh, you know, if they're single. Does that answer anybody's question there? Okay. So in the, East, in the Eastern Rite of the Church, you would have predominantly married men who are priests. In the Latin Rite or the Western Rite, you would have predominantly uh, men who are not married who are priests. And both traditions have a very long tradition that goes back more than 1,200 years, it goes back 2,000 years and even into Judaism uh, where there were uh, celibate communities or monastic communities uh, where people made promises of not marrying. Being not married is meant to symbolize Christ who was never married uh, and that he has an exclusive relationship not with one person, but with the church collectively. And so a celibate priest is meant to uh, uh, point to that. Does that answer your question? Uh, the question is, can a woman be a Catholic deacon? At this point, no, but it doesn't appear to me that the door is closed on that altogether. Uh, and there's not been any document from Rome saying that that could never be possible in the future. There has been a, a formal teaching of the church that says the Pope has no authority to ordain women or to change that teaching. He can't uh, because it's from God. But they haven't said that about uh, deacons. So 
So it's possible, and if you look at the history of deacons in the church, there were in the early church female deacons, but we're not sure they were ordained, that attended to females, ministered to females in the church, especially at times of baptism and other sorts of things. So, um, and even the orders of nuns that we have, to a certain extent, function in the role of deacon, although they're not ordained. So could, could that be open to women down the road? Possibly. But I, I'm not clairvoyant, so I don't know. So it's, it's not as, as definitive on that as it is on, on priests. Okay. Yes? Lay ministry, right. We have lay ministers, people who are not ordained, who assist priests in not confecting the Eucharist or celebrating the Eucharist, but helping us to distribute the Eucharist that's already consecrated and bringing Holy Communion to the sick and shut in. And there's just a training that you go through and the bishop commissions you, but you're not ordained. But the priest is the one that has consecrated the Eucharist and then uh, they distribute it to, either to the congregation during Mass or bring Holy Communion to the sick and homebound or, or to the dying. 